Good morning, everybody. He is risen. He is risen. This is a beautiful statement of faith for all of us. You ready? He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Amen and amen. Let's uh, greet each other now. I invite you to stand. Seek out somebody who you do not know or do not know well. Wish them a happy Easter. Let's greet each other. Well, good morning, everybody. If you wouldn't mind having a seat for just a brief moment, as we engage one another on this Easter Sunday, I wanted to just welcome all of you. For those of you who are visiting with us here for the first time in-house, in-person, or for those of you who are watching us online for the very first time, my name is David Wolverton. I'm one of the pastors here. It's a real honor for me to welcome all of you to this time of worship. Now, did you wake up this morning to uh, the smell of candy and chocolate? Anybody wish they did wake up this morning to the smell of chocolate? Yeah, we're, we're excited that God has brought us together. We use elements, symbols, to, to lead us into the presence of Almighty God. And one of those gifts that we share with one another is the egg, the Easter egg. The egg represents new life and new birth which is a gift for all of us. So every time we crack open an Easter egg, we're remembering the, the tomb opening up and Jesus giving new life to all of us as we trust in him. And every time you bite that piece of candy, well, you know, chocolate is just chocolate. It's not symbolic of anything in particular that I can think of, but it gives us that expression of new life and joy, right? And so we have the opportunity to be that gift, that symbol of new life with one another today. As we worship the Lord, we draw into the presence of Almighty God, our Lord and Savior. And as we draw into his presence, we can truly worship. So I want to share with you a passage of scripture that comes to us from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. It is a very powerful prayer that he prays on behalf of the Ephesians but also on our behalf many, many centuries later. This is what he says. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength? He exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we pray that you will draw us into your mighty presence. And by the power of your experience of new life in us, help us to celebrate the new life we have in Jesus. 
All of this, Father, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Let's worship. We invite you to join us and stand as we worship this morning.
began as you emerged from that that tomb and and that new life shaped itself out in each and every one of us lord we give you thanks for the power of that resurrection hope the power of that new life the power of what you birth into us lord we are forever grateful our lives are forever changed because of what you did for us now fill this place with your holy spirit and draw us into your presence that new life may be begin in each of us yet again today as we pray in Jesus mighty name amen and amen please be seated <clears throat> so i have a couple of questions for you do you remember do you remember do you remember? Do you remember the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941? Some of you here, you do, you remember. Many of us don't. Do you remember the first man on the moon in 1969? Do, do you remember the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963? Do you remember the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr.? 
1968. Do you remember when the Berlin Wall came down? Do you remember where you were when the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded in 1986? Do you remember 9-11? Do you remember where you were when the second plane hit the tower? Do you remember when Pharrell Williams debuted his song, Happy, in 2014? Do you remember when the Apple Watch was introduced in, 19, or in 2015? Do you remember when the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl in 2018? Do you remember when the Philadelphia Eagles won the second Super Bowl? No, you shouldn't remember that one because <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. Do you remember COVID-19 and when it shut down everything? Do you remember when no toilet paper was found in stores? Do you remember when the Game of Thrones premiered on HBO in 2011? Do you remember when the last episode of Games of Thrones was shown on May 19, 2019? Do you remember when Princess Diana was killed in a car accident? Do you remember when Prince William and Kate Middleton got married? Do you remember your first kiss? Do you remember whether it was the person who you're sitting next to right now or not? Do you remember when your eyes made contact with the person of your dreams as they walked down the aisle to the altar at your wedding day? Do you remember the first cry of your new baby? Do you remember your baby's first words? Do you remember your first colonoscopy? <laughs> How could one forget, right? Do you remember the time when you first realized that you needed Jesus?
Is it working now? Okay. All right, just come have a seat here on the stage. Just come have a seat. Perfect. Boy, you all look so wonderful in your outfits. Now, I would sit on the stage with you, but I have a little trouble getting back up when I sit that low. You can all kind of agree with that, right? <laughs> all right, so during the weeks of Lent, we heard stories of Jesus' life his death, and his resurrection. And today, I'm going to focus on one of God's special creatures, the monarch butterfly. Yay, I love the monarch <laughs> Now, as we talk about the cycle of the butterfly, you might see how this metamorphosis is another way of talking about the message of Lent. So when you look up on the screen, we have a tiny little creature. It starts as an egg. And it's all alone on the leaf. And this egg might be about an eighth of an inch big. This was kind of like Jesus in the wilderness, all alone for 40 days. He spent time with God in prayer, just like God wants you to spend time with him in prayer. Now, after several days, that egg hatches, and out comes the larva. Do you know what we call that? A caterpillar, A caterpillar that's right. So um, it spends its time on the underside of a milkweed. And you, guess what it does? It eats all the milkweed. It does. It eats and it eats and it eats and it eats. And as it eats, it grows. And this is like Jesus coming out of the desert, ready to take on his mission. He called the disciples who would help him take God's message of love and hope to a hungry world. Now, our caterpillar does not grow skin. And what I mean is it grows, but its skin doesn't grow with it. It has to shed its skin, and it sheds its skin about four or five times. The Bible tells us that following Jesus requires us to shed our skin, our old ideas and our old attitudes, and we have to change our hearts to become more like Jesus. It's kind of like being born again and getting a new opportunity to become something greater. Now, after weeks, a few weeks, that mar monarch caterpillar stops eating, and it attaches its itself to a sturdy branch or a leaf, and it attaches itself upside down. It forms the letter J. Now, that caterpillar knows that in order to become all that God tends, intends it to be, it has to be connected with something sturdy. And as it moves to the next stage of its life, it remains quietly supported, humbly trusting God. We're almost there. <laughs> the shape of the J reminds us that we can trust in Jesus to support us and to care for us no matter what changes our life might have. So a day or so later, our caterpillar is going to twist and twist and shed its final layer of skin. Only this time, you're right, it doesn't look like a caterpillar when the dead skin falls off. It's kind of a greenish sac, and it's called a pupa. And it wiggles a bit more until it settles into the quiet business of turning itself into a butterfly. A butterfly, that's butterfly. right. Now, scientists don't know how the transformation takes place. They only know that inside that chrysalis, over a two-week period, the caterpillar dissolves 
and a butterfly forms inside that chrysalis. When the outer covering of the chrysalis turns transparent, the black and orange markings of the future butterfly can be seen. What happened to the caterpillar? How did it become a butterfly? It's a mystery. The metamorphosis of our butterfly reminds us of how Holy Week, or of Holy Week, and I was just wondering while we're doing that, Emma, can you do me a favor? Can you turn this caterpillar into a butterfly? <coughs> you want to open that up and you want to take out the inside. <laughs> Last week we celebrated Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem. There was a great, large, cheering crowd, but later in the week he was arrested and he was placed on the cross. That was quite a transformation too. He was taken down from the cross on Good Friday. He was wrapped in a special cloth, and he was placed in a tomb. The tomb was a covering, kind of like our caterpillar's chrysalis. God had a plan, had a plan to transfer, Je transfer Jesus from death to life, from human to Messiah. Now, our butterfly has emerged. Do you want to stand up and show everybody the butterfly? The chrysalis cracks open, and out tumbles a wet and crumbly butterfly. Thanks, man. It immediately pumps fluid from its abdomen and slowly expands its wings, and then it flips its wings gently in the air to dry and harden them. After a few hours, our butterfly is ready to fly away. The monarch butterfly is a reminder of Jesus' resurrection. We remember that because Je if Jesus is yeah, as Jesus lives, we will live too. The difference for us is that we can live by the faith and understand God's plan. Our caterpillar probably won't ever dream of becoming a beautiful butterfly. Now, like the butterfly coming out of a dead-looking chrysalis, Jesus came out from the tomb with a resurrected body that would never die. So we've been, uh, I don't know if you've seen on Facebook, we've been growing some butterflies, and they are in the chrysalis stage, and I think March 30th has scared them because uh, they're still in that chrysalis stage. <laughs> we were going to release them today after the service, but they are still sleeping um, you can look at them. We have two different stages. We have caterpillars and we have chrysalises out in the lobby. And uh, you can look at them or have your children look at them on your way out the door. So let's uh, bend our he heads in prayer. Dear God, thank you for loving us so much that you gave your one and only son, Jesus, to save us from sin and death. We know that we can trust you to support and care for us no matter what. Please help us as we grow pray, and continue to listen for your instructions for our lives. Amen. Okay, Maggie, come over here. Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears.
blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Father God, we give you thanks for your word and for the power of your word to breathe life into our lives. So speak boldly, Father, as we, your servants, are listening. Consecrate my mouth by the power of your Holy Spirit and by the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross, that all of what we do and all of what we say may honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to share with you a a story. It comes from the Gospel of John. Now, if you think about this, this story is something that many of us, maybe even most of us, have heard before. It's the story of the very first Easter morning. Mary Magdalene goes to the the tomb. She wants to anoint Jesus' body. And when she arrives there, she discovers that the tomb is empty. Jesus' body is missing. It's not there. She's overcome, and she runs as fast as she can to go to the other disciples and And when she gets there, she says to all of them, Jesus is missing, his body is missing, the tomb is empty. And so Peter and John, the apostle, immediately take off. They run as fast as they can to get to the tomb. And they too, when they arrive, they discover that the body is missing. They see the the cloths that are that are there laying there that 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 had once covered Jesus' body. There, there, there's no body there. It says in John's gospel that they began to remember and they believed. But they didn't understand what was going on. So they go back to the upper room where they had been and and Mary stayed at the tomb. And while she's there, she's weeping, she's crying, she's pouring her heart out. And suddenly, Jesus appears. He appears to her. And she gets overcome and she grabs a hold of him and and is not wanting to let him go again. And he looks at her and he says, Mary, it's me. Go tell my brothers, go tell the other disciples what you saw 
And so in that very moment, for, for just a brief time, Mary was the only individual in all of earth who had seen the risen Lord. So she runs and she tells the disciples what she saw. Did they believe her? Did they know what was going on? A lot of unknowns. They didn't know what to believe. This is where I want to pick up the story. On that same day, John's gospel, starting at verse 19 in chapter 20. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Then verse 24, But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Hold on to that. Verse 25, So the other disciples told Thomas, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and where and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in that moment when all of the people around you were excited about something that they experienced but you had not and you needed proof? continues. Verse 26, a week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was now with them. When I was reading this, this past week in preparation for this message, I knew what I was going to be preaching for weeks. I prep, you know, well in advance. But when I was prepping the details of, of this service, something hit me that didn't hit me before. That was a whole week. What was that even like for Thomas? To go through an entire week surrounded by his friends, all of whom had experienced the risen Lord except him. What was that even like for him? Sitting around the table and everybody going, hey, did you remember this? Hey, did you see this? And, and when Jesus did this, and when Jesus so showed us this, can, can you believe that? And they're all excited. They're passionate. Their lives are clearly changed. And there's Thomas going, what about me? I didn't see. I didn't experience that. What, what am I supposed to feel? Can you get that picture? Look what happens. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, my translation, then Jesus called him out. Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Do not doubt, but believe. For years, for decades, when I've preached this passage, I've focused in on doubting Thomas. This is doubting Thomas, right? We've all may have heard about doubting Thomas and I focus on the doubt. I don't think that's exactly what's going on here. A year ago, next week, my mom passed away. But, but the way and the timing of the schedule... She died on Maundy Thursday, and two days later, I was here celebrating Easter with y'all. Grief is a unique thing, isn't it? Anybody who's lost somebody significant or lost something significant, grief doesn't necessarily make sense in the moment, but it helps, it helps when we can express that grief in the way that we best understand. 
Thomas was with Jesus for, for three years. Every day he was with this, this friend of his whose, whose teachings just radically impacted his life. And when he, he and everybody else left Jesus in the garden, his guilt, his overwhelming guilt just was so powerful. He didn't know what to do with those emotions. And then he from a distance, he saw Jesus being crucified and he experienced the profound nature of loss like many of us may have felt in our lives, losing somebody important. And so Thomas, in his unique way, when he was hearing all of the other disciples go, we saw Jesus, there was so much at stake for Thomas. So much grief what do you mean you saw Jesus? He died. So he had to come face to face with this loss, this incredible, painful absence of a friend, of his master, of the one who radically changed his life with all of the teaching. But here, here in the moment, Jesus appeared to him. And then look what happened. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The other thing that struck me this past week about this passage is, you know, there was a week. There was a week. It was an awkward week for Thomas. But in this moment, as Thomas came face to face with Jesus... Something unique happened. And it wasn't just about Jesus calling him out. Something very unique was going on. I had to ask myself, why didn't Jesus introduce his risen self to Thomas earlier? Why did he wait for a whole week? What was it that Thomas needed and what was going on in that week that we are not privy to, that only Jesus could see, that only Jesus could know? And why did Jesus wait until Thomas was in the room with everybody else to reveal himself? Why couldn't he have revealed himself to Thomas when, when Thomas was alone, when, when Thomas was going off to bed, when Thomas was taking a walk? Why was it so important for Jesus to reveal himself when everybody else was there to see it? I had to ask myself that question. Did you ever think about that? As I grapple with this, I'm not saying that my answer is the answer. But it made me wonder. While Jesus can certainly reveal himself to anybody at any time, the best revival experience, the best transformative experience happens when we realize we're connected with other believers. When we're in the room with friends. Hear me. The best revivals happen when the church is together. This is not about you know, a one-off. Oh, Thomas, was, you know, this was not a surprise to Jesus. Jesus wasn't on the other side of the door going, wait, Thomas isn't there. Maybe I should wait. How long are we going to wait? How long is he going to be? We don't know. I, you know, should I, should I come back? Maybe I'll come back. No, there was purpose in this. Just like there's purpose in the times when we have to wait for Jesus to show up. In those times when we're struggling in the doubt because we didn't see what other people saw. And maybe, maybe because of what God is doing in the week or the month or the year. Maybe it's about what Jesus is doing to prepare us to receive the revival and transformation that he has in mind for us. And God's timing is just so perfect. 
Jesus shows up exactly when God wants him there. Thomas didn't put his finger into the nail marks. He didn't put his hand into Jesus' side. That's what he had said, right, to his friends. I'm not going to believe unless I do that. He didn't do it. Jesus shows up. And Thomas responds. Sometimes Jesus shows up in ways that we don't expect. Certainly Jesus can show up in the form of an angel for us, or maybe, maybe literally he can show up physically for each and every one of us. But I dare say in the times when we have needed Jesus to show up in our lives, he's been there. We just haven't paid attention we just haven't been privy to see it, name it. How do I know? Because Jesus shows up every time the body of Christ gathers. Jesus shows up when, when you're hurting about something and suddenly a, a fellow believer, a friend, shows up. Jesus is there. Jesus shows up when you find yourself in the hospital and, and you're facing something serious and somebody from the church shows up or, or, or better yet, somebody who's a fellow believer just happens to be in the room and they start praying for you. Jesus showed up. Jesus shows up when you least expect it. He shows up in very tangible ways and very physical ways that, that just don't show themselves to be like Jesus with marks in his hands and side. He shows up because he loves us, and that was the whole point of Easter. And maybe, <clears throat> maybe you're wired to want proof. I'm here to tell you on Easter Sunday that the proof is sitting right next to you. The proof is there. Jesus, <clears throat> in that upper room, breathed on the disciples the Holy Spirit, and he said to them something very specific. He said, <clears throat> those who you forgive will be forgiven. And those who you withhold forgiveness from, forgiveness will be withheld. So the true evidence of the resurrection for me is when the body of Christ forgives. It's interesting, as Colleen shared <clears throat> A caterpillar has to give the impression to us of being dead before we see transformation and new life. Something in us must die in order for new life to emerge. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's a, a sinful pattern. Maybe it's brokenness from our past. Maybe it's a, an addiction. Maybe whatever it is in our individual past, something in us must die, and we need to let it die in order for new life to emerge. And that surge, that surge inside of us is the surge of the Spirit, who on Easter that first morning transformed Mary's life, Peter's life, John's life, and all of the other disciples, and one week later, transformed Thomas. And from that point forward, <clears throat> that Holy Spirit gift has transformed millions of lives. You want evidence? Take a look around you. you may just discover that Jesus is in the room. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your presence in our midst, for the gift of new life. Thank you for being the one who died on our behalf so that we could experience new life and transformation here and now. Lord, whether it's today or a week from now or a month or a year, Lord, I pray that you would open the eyes of every individual in this room and everybody 
who's watching us online. Open all of our eyes to see the risen Jesus in front of us and among us. As we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. It's still me. <laughs> I had such a great exit. Didn't I just have a great exit? It's like, man. It's like, okay. This is an even better exit. Perhaps you're sitting in this room right now, and you're feeling the nudge of the Holy Spirit. We're a, we're a church that believes in taking a next step, whatever that next step may look like for you. And maybe, maybe for you, you want to you wanna mark today as the day of new beginnings. <laughs> to my right and your left, we have a baptismal font. I want to invite you, if you're here today and you want to, you for the first time, uh, be baptized in Jesus to experience what that new life and transformation means, I welcome you to join me over there. Maybe you're here and you've been baptized as a child or as an infant. Maybe you don't even remember any of that, but you remember you had a piece of paper that said you were baptized, and you want today to be the marker of a new day, a new beginning. I invite you to come over, and we'll reaffirm your baptism in the name of Jesus. Don't be concerned about what other people will think of you they already know. They know. Like Thomas, you're part of a room of believers who want the best for you. They want you to see Jesus just like they see Jesus. They want to share Jesus with you. So don't be concerned about, about what they will think. If you're feeling that nudge of the Spirit to take a next step, join me over there. And trust that what God is birthing in you is good. Be in the spirit of worship and prayer.
again I was made for more Why I make Bed in my shame With a bounty of grace Running my way I know I am yours I was made for more Back to life again. I was made for more. So why would I make a bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way? I know I am yours, and I was made for. person in this room, especially the people in the room who might not otherwise be here but for Easter. They're as loved and valued as everyone else. And you show up when they show up. Thank you, God, for this week, for showing up, for taking your punishment, for dying on the cross, and for rising again all for our sake. When you show up, that's how we show up. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father God, we give you thanks for the gift of new life. We thank you for receiving all of our brokenness, all of, all of the issues of our life that we can't even control. We thank you that you are Lord and that there is nothing, absolutely nothing that can separate us from the love of God as we find in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that today is the marker of a new day. Thank you, Lord. As we pray in Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. As I had indicated, we're a church that believes in next steps. So if you're here and you didn't want to come in a public arena, but you want to receive baptism or renewal, I'm going to be over there after our service. Just feel free to come on over. It's very casual. And if you are here and you want to take a different kind of next step, there are cards in the seat cushions right in front of you. They're called next step cards. Feel free to take one, put your name on it, and, and check off whatever it is that next step you want to make on behalf of the Lord today. Maybe it's just offering a prayer concern or a praise item. Uh, feel free to write that on the back of the card and place those cards in one of the offering boxes out in our lobby area. If you've brought an offering today, you can place that in the offering boxes as well. We trust that the Lord brought you here for a reason because nothing is not intentional with God. 
He brought you here. You may think, yeah, maybe I'm here because I'm with family and the family told me I'm coming. Yeah, it's okay. But don't miss this. God sees you. God hears you. God knows you. He knows you by name, and he has called you by name. And we're thankful that you're here. May God bless you and fill you anew each and every day. And as you go forth from this house of worship, having sung with your lips and heard with your ears the good news message that Jesus, he suffered and died for you, and he rose to new life for you. Then I invite you to go forth from this house of worship as, as lives that have been changed by Jesus Christ. Like Mary, like Peter, like John, like Thomas, and like everybody else who's ever heard or seen the risen Lord. God bless you. Have a great Easter. Amen. Some of you are going to go forth and some of you are going to hang, but either way, I'm going to ask you to stand. So we're going to play the last song. Have a great day, everybody.